on this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, Diesel, U.S. Tankers, and the Joneses. Not Pat Jones, the other Jones. Hi, I'm your host, Sal Mercoglan, and welcome to this episode of What's Going On With Shipping. A lot going on, and one of the things I wanted to take some time and talk about and unpack is the issue regarding the escalating costs of diesel fuel, particularly on the New England, mid-Atlantic coast of the United States, and the role that U.S. tankers and the Jones Act plays in the situation that's unfolding. If you caught my latest episode of What to Ship, you would have heard me say, the next thing you're about to hear is a lot of companies and a lot of oil companies and a lot of brokers start blaming the whole situation on diesel fuel on the Jones Act. And I hate to say it, I was right. And so what I want to do is take some time, unpack that. I just posted a marathon Twitter thread, and I want to take that Twitter thread and use it as the basis of today's video. Before we do so, if you're new to the channel, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's jump into our story. So in that last episode of What the Ship, I talked about this document right here, This Week in Petroleum that comes out from the U.S. Energy Information uh, Administration. And in particularly here, you have this section here, which deals with distillate diesel fuel. And as, as we kind of all know, we really don't need a chart to show this to us, but we saw the climb here in diesel fuel costs. This goes back to 2020, June of 2020 pretty steady. And then an increase here toward the end of 2020 into 2021, saw that maintain itself to the end of 2021. Again, a lot more people start to drive as all of a sudden we see the uh, coming off of restrictions from COVID. But more importantly, there was a downward turn in production, but then all of a sudden this huge jump right here in March. And that has a lot to do with what happened with the Russia-Ukraine war and the sanctions against Russian diesel and Russian petroleum products coming out of the area. These sanctions are coming into full force, particularly in the United States, as a story by G-Captain uh, from Reuters on April 20th. Nine tankers carrying Russian origin fuel and uh, crude and fuel oil have discharged in the United States in April likely the last ones to deliver before a wind down set by Washington expires this week. Customs and tracking data show the United States last month sent April 22nd ban on imports of Russian crude and refined products. The United States gave importers of Russian petroleum, liquefied natural gas and coal 45 days to take in route and under contract cargo. So the U.S. gave a window there for importers of Russian crude and Russian oil to get their product into the United States before they would shut it down. And you're probably sitting there going, well, wait a minute, Sal, why in the world are we importing Russian crude oil, Russian coal, all this Russian petroleum? Why is it coming in? Why are we getting Russian oil and Russian diesel? Well, it has to go with the fact that we haven't built in a refinery in the United States since the 1970s. This is a 2005 story from the New York Times. No new refineries in 29 years. Again, that's 2005. So you're going back to 1976, 1977, since there has been a new refinery built in the United States. Add to it the fact that the oil that's coming out of the ground in the United States today is a lot different than the oil that was coming out of the ground back then. Lighter fracking oil is different than heavier crude oil. And refineries handle different oils better. And we find ourselves in a very kind of unique position these days regarding the import and export of oil. This chart here from EI shows you three different things I, I want to detail here. So this one here, U.S. distillate production. Again, the orange here is 2021. The blue is 21-22. You can see the huge dip there when COVID hit in March of 2020 right there. But this is talking about U.S. distillate production in millions of barrels Per day, where we pretty much followed previous, we're a little bit higher here, but when you start looking at imports and exports, you start seeing something a little different. Imports right here, you see that kind of dip. We go below the chart here for 21, uh, uh, 22, and then when it comes into exports, the U.S. is exporting more oil than before. And much of this has to do with a variety of factors, and it doesn't have a lot to do with the Jones Act. 
So one of the first issues that comes up of why we need U.S. tankers that are U.S. built, U.S. flagged, U.S. owned, and U.S. operated hauling oil and petroleum, particularly diesel right now, between U.S. ports goes back to the national security of the United States. Recent report here by CSBA, which is a organization right here, the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, has done a series of reports. This one I'll highlight, this is Sustaining the Fight, Resilient Maritime Logistics for a New Era, makes the case, <coughs> excuse me, that the U.S. is critically short of tankers to support not just the U.S. Navy, but the U.S. military overseas. While, yes, we have Navy oilers to refuel the fleet, what we're missing are those commercial tankers that go from the United States and provide fuel either to overseas depots or to U.S. naval tankers or right to the beaches to provide fuel for our military forces. And a lot of those tankers that are in war plans are involved in what's called the Jones Act trade, the coastal trade of the United States. And so they play a role in this report, I did the fact that they're woefully short of the necessary number of tankers needed for any sort of peer-to-peer -peer conflict with a, a nation like Russia or potentially China. So let's go to talk about the reason why this is happening. So again, come back to the e EIA report again. And again, this report is, is really great for showing things. One of the things that it shows you here is distillate stocks, millions of barrels, uh, and days of supply. And one of the things that becomes very clear is, number one, uh, going in to 2021, we were above supply. But then over the course of the period from about, again, end of 2020 until the end of 2021, we were slowly kind of depleting our stock. And now we are below what is traditionally. Now, be careful. This is not zero, this line. This is still 100 million barrels. But we're below the five-year average, which is pretty important. And this shows you days of supply of how much fuel uh, we have left. Again, if you look at the period just a few years ago, uh, just last year, we're just a little bit below of where we have been in the past. And if you do it by region, uh, what you'll notice is a lot of these regions are pretty stable. The one exception here is the blue line, which is the East Coast. And the East Coast has basically, which had been the top area, now ranks third. And the question is why? And again, it has to do with the, the oil market. The group that's screaming most for Jones Act waivers will be oil companies because they want to use foreign flag vessels to move oil between areas. And they always wanna use foreign flag vessels because they view them as cheaper alternatives. They don't like being constrained by the US Jones Act and US regulations. However, this story from March, late March, New York sends diesel cargo to Europe in rare trade flow re reversal. US fuel markets are getting even tighter as Europe scramble for alternatives to Russian diesel flip New York from a typical import region to an export. In a rare reversal of normal trade flows, New York is sending two diesel cargos to Europe, which relies on Russia for about a third of its diesel fuel needs. The flip-flop is an example of how Russia's invasion of Ukraine is rattling fuel markets. Two tankers, the Fal Falcon Nostos and the Energy Centaur are carrying more than 700,000 barrels of diesel from New York to Europe, according to Vortex. Uh, again, what you're seeing, the reason they're pulling diesel out of New York is because of money. It's more profitable to sell that diesel fuel in Europe because demand is much higher and therefore they can get a bigger market. What does that do? It depletes the stocks in New York. That's what I said in What the Ship recently and even prior to that, I was saying that you're going to hear this scream about the Jones Act, but the ocean oil companies are manipulating the system to create the problem. They are creating the problem. And you saw that in the decrease in the New York area by the stocks in New York uh, and, and New England going down. Now, understand, you can sit there and say, well, wait a minute, Sal, time out, time out. What do I care if it's a US flagship carrying it or a foreign flagship? All I care about is how much I pay when I put the, you know, pull my truck or whatever vehicle I have that uses diesel fuel up to the pump or I'm paying for transportation costs. Well, the reason you care about it is this right here. So this is a presentation I did on the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, and I entitled it America's First National Maritime Stra Strategy. The 
end of World War One, we passed this act. And you hear about this act all the time. This is the Jones Act that's in the title. And what most people talk about the Jones Act being is the coastal trade, Section 27. Well, there's 30 something sections of this act. And what was created in 1920 was a grand encompassing maritime strategy that looked at everything, international trade, coastal trade, shipbuilding, uh, mariners' rights, cargo preference. Everything was included in this bill. And over the past century, we have slowly knocked the legs out from our national maritime strategy so that now we have very few things that underpin our national maritime strategy. One of them is cargo preference the uh, requirement to haul certain cargo by the United States uh, flag vessels. Another one is the Maritime Security Program. That is a federal uh, kind of grant for maintaining a fleet of 60 ships in the US registry for use in time of war. However, in those 60 vessels, there's only two tankers that are involved in international transport of fuel largely over to Israel. Uh, but nowhere near enough tankers to support U.S. military operations. And then the third one is the Jones Act, the coastal trade of the United States. And as I say in this presentation here, the whole purpose here and the, and, and the preamble of the act talks about the fact that the U.S. needs a commercial merchant marine to haul a portion of its commercial cargo, not all, but a portion, but also a merchant marine that can be used as an auxiliary in time of war. And this is the issue that I drew attention with, with the Department of Defense, with the Department of Transportation, with the Navy, with the U.S. Transportation Command, with the Military Sea Lift Command, with the Maritime Administration. And I think all those organizations need to get their head out their ass and talk about the fact that we need a commercial merchant marine to support the U.S. military in time of war. They pay lip service to this. They will say this, but they don't do anything to promote the U.S. Merchant Marine, and that is my criticism I have with them. Go forward here. We saw this not too long ago when the Colonial Pipeline had its issue. Immediately, oil companies put in for waivers to move oil and fuel from the U.S. Gulf Coast up along the East Coast of the United States. Now, remember, the Colonial Pipeline shut down on purpose. They had been hit by a ransomware attack and they take, took themselves out of service because they didn't want damage to the pipeline. However, what everybody missed was number one, that there was plenty of oil stored, fuel, diesel, whatever you needed in tanks all along the Colonial Pipeline. There was plenty, there were days of supplies there. What happened was the panic happened. The US you know, basically created a panic out of this situation. Everybody ran to every gas truck and the situation of why there were fuel shortages had nothing to do with U.S. tankers. It had to do with the fact of the number of tractor trailers hauling gas to gas stations around the East Coast of the United States. Nothing to do that. Matter of fact, the argument here was there were eight U.S. flag tankers sitting in ports out of service because there was no need for them. So they were laid up. It was going to take them about a week or two to activate and that wasn't fast enough for some people. This is one of the reasons why the Maritime Administration, U.S. Transportation Command needs to be working with our Jones Act tank carriers to create a reserve status for tankers that are not in active service so that they can be activated in less than two weeks. They can be activated in three to five days if needed. And you had oil companies put in for waivers to move oil. Two of waivers were eventually approved. However, they put in for waivers to move U.S. oil from the Gulf of Mexico to the West Coast. Nothing to do with the Colonial Pipeline. But that's the advantage that companies will take when they see it, that they will go ahead and jump ahead and try to take advantage because what they want to see happen here is the Jones Act go away. And I've written extensively about this. I wrote an entire history on the century of the Jones Act for Sea History magazine. This is a magazine put out by the National Maritime Historical society. Uh, and I'll have a link to it here so that you can take a look at it. But even right now with everybody screaming about Jones Act waivers, what no one is doing is number one, looking at where U.S. tankers are in the along the United States coast. This is U.S. tankers from Fleetmon along the coast of the United States. Talk to a person a person who works for one of the major oil tanker companies in the United States. And he's got ships right now ready to go. Right now, ready to go. Not only do we have U.S. tankers ready to go, but the charter rates for them are substantially below the spot charter rates you could potentially get 
for foreign tankers. Foreign tankers right now are probably shooting around $85,000 a day. There was a, a story here uh, in, by Greg Miller at Freight Waves talking about this, how basically the uh, uh, world is crying for diesel and the product tankers are the big winners. But I mean, they're talking about $85,000 per day for a tanker. Jones Act carriers are talking about $60,000, $65,000 a day for tankers. And understand, the Jones Act market, the U.S. coastal market, is much different than many other markets. Number one, it's not a huge market in many ways. It's also a very short market. Going from the Gulf Coast to the East Coast, that's two, three days sailing, tops. Most tankers are hauling oil cross transoceanic. That's weeks of hauling. And tankers only get paid from the moment they load the cargo to the moment they discharge. The minute they empty the cargo, they're off hire. And that means that tankers have to make money to be able to pay for the crew maintenance of the vessel when they're not hauling cargo. So shorter rates or shorter distances tend to be higher rates. But right now, because of this demand, as Greg Miller notes in this story, is rates are going through the roof so that actually Jones Act tankers may be more profitable or more, uh, more cost effective than foreign flag tankers. And plus, can I be clear, even if you're more expensive, how much more does that charter rate raise the price to haul a gallon of fuel across a vessel that's carrying 80 to 120,000 tons of fuel? If you're paying $20,000 more, let's say, for a tanker versus another tanker, and you're paying that over three days, four days, five, let's go five days, you're paying $20,000 a day more over five days, that's $100,000. That's across 100,000 tons, tons, not gallons, tons of fuel. How much does that $1 on top of a ton of fuel translate into your tank? It's a good question. It's one that those who oppose the Jones Act don't like to deal with. Uh, the other issue we have, and this is a military issue, again, one of the reasons why DOD, the Department of the Navy, uh, the, the Army, the Marine Corps, the Air Force, Space Force, Space Force should be involved in talking about this is we have the closure of the biggest fuel depot in the Pacific at Red Hill. The Red Hill facility, which is shutting down in Hawaii, is going to eliminate the largest stockpile of Department of Defense fuel in the world. And in a scenario where the U.S. has to go from the U.S. across the Pacific to China, Korea, wherever, the loss of that fuel is going to be significant. How do you replace that fuel? You need tankers and not just Navy oilers operated by the Military Sealift Command. You need commercial tankers. That's exactly what happened in World War II. Did a whole video on this about the start of World War II and how we had to get 20 commercial tankers to supplement six Navy oilers and sustain the U.S. Pacific Fleet until the, the, the forces could be built up. And you can see this demonstrated by entities like the Military Sealift Command. Here's a Navy oiler off the southern coast of California doing what's called a consul, a consolidated at sea refueling operation with a commercially chartered vessel, in this case, the Empire State. And you know, what we need is more than two vessels, the Empire State, and the Evergreen State. We need multiple vessels from this. And matter of fact, what this does is potentially relieve MSC oilers to be forward deployed to support the fleet out as opposed to running around the world and then looking like crap uh, because they got rust running down them because they're maintaining at sea a long bit. This goes into the entirety of the ability of the United States commercial merchant marine to support the Department of Defense in time of war. Again, where's the Department of Defense? Where's the Department of Transportation? Where's the Joint Chiefs of Staff? Where's the CNO? Where are all these people on talking about this? They will all say, oh, we support the US Merchant Marine. You need action. You need action. You just don't need to be speaking about this. They need support. And again, DOD is the largest user of shipyards and, and repair facilities for vessels in the United States. And one of the reasons why we're having such problems in our shipyards and with a lot of our naval vessels is we're not building commercial vessels. In terms of deep draft, ocean going vessels, we didn't build one commercial vessel last year. There's one ship built up on the Great Lakes. There are two more being built down in Brownsville, Texas for Pasha lines 
but none others for the United States. And what happens is, and this is what some of these critics will do, is they'll criticize the cost to build one or two vessels in the United States and compare it to the cost of building the similar size vessels in Japan, Korea, and uh, China. And the problem with that is Japan, Korea, China build 94% of all the world shipping. When they build a ship, they're not building one ship, they're building a, an assembly line of ships. They're building ships for multiple groups. And when you build a lot of ships, that's an assembly line that defrays your cost. Again, go buy a Ford F-150 from a dealer and then go build yourself a Ford F-150 from scratch. Guaranteed, the Ford F-150 you buy from the, from the dealer is going to be a heck of a lot cheaper than the one you build from scratch. Because when you're building just one or two ships, those are works of art, those aren't ships. And that's the problem we see consistently throughout this. Now, listen, I'm not sitting there saying the Jones Act is perfect and everything is great. I'm not. There needs to be reform. I did a whole discussion about this when we were talking about liquefied natural gas going up to New England uh, earlier this year. I think there, there are opportunities where we do need to waive the Jones Act. For example, in bringing LNG carriers into the US domestic trade, we're not building LNG carriers. I think we should temporarily waive that provision to bring in LNG carriers. However, we did build LNG carriers in the 70s and 80s. We were the pioneer building LNG carriers. And I think one of the things we should do is if you bring in a LNG carrier from overseas, I happen to know there are some Russian vessels that are being built in Korea right now. And with everything going on, I bet you we can get them. If you bring those vessels into the US fleet, you operate them for five to 10 years with the provision that they be replaced by US build vessels. And you develop a program, which I detail in this video about how to do that. There are ways to do this. The problem is there are groups again that just don't wanna do that. They just want to basically rip the, you know, basically repeal and move on. You know, one of the biggest ones who do that is Cato. Cato is one of the biggest ones that do it. Hang on. That's not Cato. That's uh, that's the wrong one. Uh, it's uh, that's Cato fashion. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I'm hearing from the booth that I, I, I inadvertently got the wrong Cato up there. Uh, obviously, there's another Cato. But anyway, uh, great fashion. Uh, hardly strongly recommend this Cato over the other Cato. But what they're advocating is is, you know, repeal you know, just get rid of the Jones Act, just repeal it and everything will be better. And my problem with that is you can basically wish the dream, but what you're going to do is cripple the United States' ability to sustain itself with a U.S. domestic fleet. And more importantly, you're going to cripple the ability of the U.S. to execute its sea lift strategy. And, you know, the idea for getting lower costs at that expense is a big problem for me. And understand, the fact that we have ignored this for a long time has been detrimental to the U.S. merchant marine. You know, too long, the U.S. government, the Department of Defense, the Department of Transportation have ignored and allowed the U.S. merchant marine and the maritime sector to decline to the detriment of the U.S. shipbuilding base and the U.S. military, in particularly the U.S. Navy. Did an entire video here that documents from World War II to the present day, the decline of the U.S. merchant marine. And understand what is needed now is acta non verba. That's the motto of the U.S. Merch merchant marine academy, action, not words. And what I hope to do with this video is provoke maybe a little bit of action before we go crazy and sit there and say, we gotta repeal the Jones Act or issue Jones Act waivers to get diesel fuel from the West, from the Gulf Coast, up to the East Coast, take a breath and take a look at what's available out there. There are U.S. tankers out there. We still have plenty of diesel fuel around the country. Uh, again, it's movement. What's the Colonial Pipeline doing? What's, what are these commercial firms doing to move the diesel fuel? What has been done to manipulate the market to create this issue? That's the issues we should be looking at. And if we are short on tankers, then we need to be building commercial tankers. We need commercial tankers so that we're not over-reliant on foreign flag ships to move 100% of our cargo. Look what's going on and has gone on over the past year and a half with the supply chain in ports like LA and Long Beach when the big nine ocean carrier container companies control the system. You're seeing it with the Ocean Shipping Reform Act that's going through the House and Senate right now. And you're seeing it, a lot of people are wising up to the idea that we really need a domestic fleet that can not carry everything. We don't want everyone to carry anything, but what happens if one of these big ocean carriers or these companies self-sanction us, and now all of a sudden our trade is 
dependent on them. That's the reason we passed the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, because in 1914, when the world went to war and we were neutral, all of a sudden our goods piled up on the dock and we couldn't move our imports and our exports. Hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos when they come out. Give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, and if you can, share it across social media. And go over to our Patreon page, support the channel so that we can bring videos like this to you and I can figure out which keto is the right keto to do. I don't know how I made that mistake. I, I, I feel embarrassed. Until our next video, this is Sal signing off.